uh, Stephen Treach to talk about uh, concrete preservation. Well, it's good to be here. It's been a while since I've been in a great state of Mississippi. Uh, I think it was in July. Uh, went to Vicksburg and believe it or not, uh, gave a six hour presentation. Luckily, I had somebody help me on um, best practices to the Corps of Engineers. So who'd have thought? Corps would have invited us down to talk about best practices for concrete pavement. At any rate, I think that just kind of goes to show that there's still a lot of us out there that still have something to learn. And that's kind of what we saw there. There were a lot of young engineers there at, at the Corps that still are kind of in the process of learning how things get done. Uh, and I'm just gonna throw this out a little bit. The one thing that I came away from the Corps was that if, if you know somebody who's a recent graduate, civil engineering or a related field, if you think they may want to go after a master's or a PhD, uh, the lab supervisor there, the head of the, the lab, told me that the Corps of Engineers will pay you to go get your master's or PhD while you're drawing your full salary. And they pay for all the costs to attend school of your choice. Not bad if you really want to go ahead and further your education. I was pretty amazed at that. So as we go through these, I typically don't like to read every word on a word slide. Uh, also, I've got a lot of pictures, so I don't like to get into a lot of demonstration on the pictures. I think you can kind of look at those and kind of get the, the gist of everything before I get into it. But uh, I was here at this particular location, uh, and I can't remember when it was, probably four or five years ago, maybe somebody, um, uh, Lindy, were, I think it was materials meeting, wasn't it, that was here several years ago? And that was a great meeting. Uh, so uh, very pleased to be back here in the great state of Mississippi again, and certainly appreciate the invitation. Here's the brief outline. I'm gonna talk a little bit about service life, not a lot, but just uh, very briefly, the typical treatments. I've got those listed right here. As was mentioned earlier, uh, there's uh, currently five checklists out there. There's two more that's going to be developed, so we will be covering all of these, and essentially that checklist series that uh, Jason mentioned. And then uh, at the end, I'm going to talk a little bit about concrete overlays. We're starting to see a little bit of that aspect. I know uh, most people wouldn't think that's kind of into the preservation aspect of it, but when you look into the holistic aspect of uh, maintaining that asset management, that might be something that uh, one of your states might be interested in. And then we'll very briefly go through uh, a quick summary. Uh, the investment, uh, there's a lot of money that's going into infrastructure. We hope with the uh, a uh, new bill that's coming out, and again, you know, we have to start thinking about the new bill, the highway bill, because this current one's going to be over another year, uh, well, a year from this September. So it seems kind of odd. It seems like we just got the last one passed, but now we have to start getting into the aspect of getting another one. So s when we look at service investment, that's when we have to kind of think, uh, well, what are we going to do long term? And when we talk about long term, then we also have to talk about performance curve. Seems like everybody likes to see a performance curve up there. There is no standard performance curve as we've seen in several of the different presentations. They all kind of are different based on what material type you may have to begin with and then what sort of actions you're going to take a little bit later on. But why concrete preservation? Well, this is kind of an old slide. If you'll see the date on there, this is 1925. 1925. Pretty interesting, isn't it? So that's no concrete pavement. Uh, that was in the great state of Ohio. And if you look on there, these, the, between the yellow lines, that's essentially the original concrete pavement that was placed in 1890, 1893. So this particular, if you look at it, is uh, 1893, seven, so that's 32 years old right there. Not bad for an old concrete slab. So essentially this is kind of what that service life curve might look like. It went out there quite a ways and then you had a little jump and then it went out there a little bit further. 2018, 125 years, there it is today, 125 years. So when we start talking about pavement preservation, we like to think that there's a possibility that we can extend some of our concrete pavements out there quite a ways. So as I mentioned a little bit earlier, we've got several of them that we're going to look at. Again, this is very quick, just a snapshot. It was mentioned uh, earlier by Jason that tomorrow afternoon uh, we'll actually cover in depth a couple of these. 
and uh, that essentially kind of gets into more of the peer-to-peer, -peer. but with uh, 30 minutes we have today, I can just kind of briefly touch on them. I will mention that the uh, concrete uh, the CP Tech Center, Concrete Pavement, uh, Concrete Pavement Technology Center, we, we do put out a lot of publications. Uh, this is one, the Concrete Pavement Preservation Guide. It was published in 2014. We've got uh, 12 chapters that are listed there. Essentially covers most everything that uh, we've already mentioned before. I would like to point out that every publication that we do is peer reviewed. And we have state agencies on every single publication along with industry and academia. So it's a, it's a very strenuous document. Uh, again, it's 2014. We tend to, if we can, update them as quick as possible when we find out that there's new technologies, processes, et cetera, out there. Uh, they're completely free on the website. You just download the PDF. If there's one chapter you want to look at and just grab that one, put it in your little, uh, your desktop, and then you can kind of go along with it. So we're going to kind of get into uh, the different techniques. The first one I'm going to mention is diamond grinding. Not a lot of magic. I think everybody's probably seen and seen it, uh, several pictures already uh, at, at this uh, conference. But essentially we're just moving, removing a little bit of the surface off there. And typically we see that we need to do that in regard to maybe faulting. Or if we go out there and we have to do a dial bar retrofit, something like that, where we essentially change the surface course of it a little bit, and then we want to go out and essentially plane it, if you will, or smooth it out. So here's uh, just a kind of a little series of snapshots. I've got several of these with the different applications. You note in the upper left, uh, that essentially we've already made a pass. You can see at the forefront, that's the diamond ground section. Uh, if you look at that real close, you'll see there's a little lip. Well, what we've essentially taken out on that particular slide is the faulting of that concrete pavement. Uh, for those of you who may be uh, a little gray beard like the person standing in front of you uh, in the uh, 80s and, and really almost up to the early 90s, uh, we built a lot of plain pavements out there. Didn't have any load transfer in them. And essentially what we did, we essentially built in uh, from an entrepreneur standpoint, an industry for the diamond grinders. So it became uh, an opportunity for somebody to go out there and start a new business. So you'll notice uh, the next slide over on the right, uh, we're essentially making another pass. Uh, what I want to point out is that depending on your specifications, when you go out there and, and put a job together, if you do have tight time constraints, that essentially lets the contractor know what sort of equipment he may need in order to get the job done in a timely manner. So in this case, we've actually got three of the essentially larger type uh, grinding machines out there. Uh, those particular machines would essentially have a four foot width. You put those in tandem, then essentially you've got one lane at your diamond grind just moving right down the road. So it can be done. And then of course, uh, the bottom right, so that's just essentially showing the uh, surface texture. So when we talk about diamond grinding, most people look at it in regard to getting a smoother pavement. So what I've got here is kind of a slide that shows the IRI. This was an actual job that was done maybe December. Do you remember, Larry, was that? Uh, project was finished, uh, I think, about three months ago, four months ago. They did have an open house down there. At any rate, it's the I-10, which is the Katy Freeway in Houston. I know somebody here from Texas probably very familiar with that. If you'll notice on the graph, the upper limits, essentially what I'm showing here, at least I hope is yellow on the, on the screens, those were the original IRI numbers. If you look at that, that essentially goes up to 160. So for most of us, we would probably notice the ride wasn't super smooth in that regard. However, after they went through and did the diamond grinding, they essentially reduced those numbers essentially by more than half. So we're really down there essentially less than 60 for most of those sections. So that's pretty good, pretty good for going through a pass. But this is something else. This is the noise level, the perceived noise that we all feel when we're driving down the road. Maybe we all feel that or hear that, but what may be more important is the neighborhood that you're running through. And so in this case, uh, the Katy Freeway, probably uh, in locations, I think there's probably 10, 12 lanes, six lanes each direction, I believe. And 
the neighborhood there uh, with all that traffic, they were pretty concerned about the noise. So this essentially shows that there was a technique kind of called next generation diamond grinding to where it's done to actually lower the noise levels. So if you look again on the yellow, that's essentially the noise levels before they diamond ground. And then if you look down lower, you'll see in the green and blue, and those were taken at two different time periods, uh, three months and then six months later, you'll see the reduction. That's a huge reduction. That's almost six decibels. And if you remember your noise, I think, uh, I think it's a logarithmic scale. So when you start reducing each decibel by just one, you've made a tremendous improvement as far as the noise level. So they were able to essentially on this particular project go down to a reduction of six decibels. That's uh, just a huge, huge benefit. Full depth repair. Uh, there are a few key factors here with full depth repair. I'm just going to mention a couple of them. One of them is typically we would say you need to go a minimum of four feet when you're doing a full, full depth repair. The purpose of that is really to allow the equipment to get in there and essentially uh, do the drilling to essentially reestablish the load transfer or in other words to put the dial bars back in. There's several different methods to removing the material. If you look in the upper left, here we're taking the slab out all in one piece. Uh, it's fairly commonplace. Uh, if you do that, then you essentially don't disturb the, the base material underneath. Uh, we've, on the next uh, portion of the slide, on the right, si right side, we've got essentially a gang drill in there to where we can essentially drill all of the, the uh, holes for the dial bar to slip into at one time. And then, of course, uh, the bottom left, we've got the placement and then the finishing on the right. Parcel depth repair. What we're finding in the parcel depth repair is that some states right now are essentially going with more of a milling type machine to essentially remove the uh, deteriorated material away from that longitudinal transverse joint. Uh, again, when we get into the parcel depths, we have to make sure that we have the proper material to essentially put in the backfill or to uh, replace what we've removed. Probably one of the most important criteria is in regard to the patching aspects is the limits of the patch itself. Absolutely critical that you don't limit yourself as to where that exterior point would be. And when we get into more of the peer-to-peer -peer type exchanges, we'll get into a lot more of uh, that discussion there. We also like to point out that anytime you do a, a repair on a joint, you have to reestablish where that joint was. So many times we'll go ahead and we'll put in uh, essentially a, a reformer, which could be, uh, uh, depending on where you're at, what the size would be, it could be essentially maybe a, a piece of cardboard, which is plasticized, or maybe uh, some mastic or something like that. Again, we always like to point out that we have to have proper curing. Curing is always, always most important on a concrete pavement. So here in the upper left, we're showing essentially what a small milling head would be where you're just going along uh, and, and uh, milling out really where you've got uh, the deteriorated material. Uh, it's kind of a little bit easier to see on the upper right-hand portion of the slide. Uh, that is essentially showing the milling head. You'll note that in this case, we don't really have a lot of vertical edges. That's essentially feathered out. Uh, we're starting to see some of those particular type patches have actually performed quite well. Uh, for, for people of my generation, that would have been essentially a no-no 20 years ago. Uh, we always felt at that point in time you had to have that nice clean vertical face. Uh, we didn't think the material would, would stay or have the longevity if it was feathered. Now we're finding out that with the materials that we have today, that's not the case. So improvements have been made. And I will say this, that uh, we always have to be cognizant that what worked five years ago may not work as good today. What we find tomorrow may be the best thing for two years from now. So we always like to make sure that we can keep the updates going in there. And then of course, uh, uh, the bottom two sections there would you see in uh, the placement. Dalbar retrofit, uh, this has been used quite a bit in the upper Midwest and even in the West. Uh, that essentially is put in there to restore the load transfer. I mentioned earlier that in the late 70s and a lot of payments in the 80s, they didn't have load transfer. So what we found out with the faulting, et cetera, et cetera, if we went in there and essentially put three or four dials in each of the wheel paths, then we could reestablish that load transfer. And typically what we do with every dial bar retrofit project is to diamond grind it. 
there's a couple of reasons for that. Uh, for one, uh, we're putting in the, the dowels because we probably had some faulting out there, so we need to do the diamond grinding anyway to reestablish the profile. And the other one is that uh, in any application, uh, it's a very uh, labor-intensive procedure. If you can get that close when you're doing it, uh, putting in the backfill material, et cetera, et cetera, you don't have to absolutely get it down perfectly in line with what the existing profile is. You can leave a little bit on top. You don't want to short the material, but you can leave a little bit on top, and that's essentially rectified when we go through with the diamond grinder. Here's a couple of pictures in the upper left. This, this particular machine will essentially cut three slots at one time which is essentially what you're seeing in the upper right-hand section. There's, there's three slots that have been essentially diamond ground all at one time. The bottom left, that's where we're showing essentially the dowel bar that you go and, and put in essentially that slot for the load transfer. Uh, I will tell you that uh, IG&GA has a dowel bar which actually has the caps and the insert in there. So if you'd like to see a little bit closer viewpoint of that, just stop by the booth uh, at the exhibits uh, right after this. And then, of course, uh, we're putting the backfill material in the bottom right corner there. This is just to kind of give you an idea of the longevity of some of the dial bar placements. This is in the state of Washington. Uh, they started their retrofits probably in the early 90s, 92, 93, something like that. Uh, there's a couple of different colors in here. The blue, that's the age of the concrete pavement when the dowel bar retrofit was applied. So if you'll notice, uh, there's green on top of that. That's how long, that's the longevity of the years that, that essentially dowel bar retrofit has been out there. There's a little bit, if you look on the very left-hand portion of the slide, there's a little bit of gray on the top of the very first one, a little bit of yellow and a little bit of black on uh, the next couple. Those are projects that they had to go into uh, in the last year or two and actually do some other work. So there was an overlay on a portion of one of them. Uh, there was a section within a project on another one that was reconstructed. But if you look at all of the other projects, they're all still out there and performing quite well. So what, what we're really showing here is that the original payments were between uh, 20 and, you know, some of them were up to 40 years old before they actually were had some dial bar retrofits, and some of those dial bar retrofits have been out there for 20 to 24 years. Pretty good performance. Here's another item, slab stabilization jacking. That's essentially, uh, we found some of those pavements out there might have had some poor sub-base, sub-grade control out there, so we, we had some maybe cavitation, something like that, poor compaction. Uh, essentially, if we can go back in there and we can essentially restore what's underneath it for the support, then we can go ahead and get some more longevity out there. So we're kind of showing a couple of pictures here. Uh, the upper left, uh, certainly we've had some subsidence there. Uh, that would be something that if we were driving down there would probably get a pretty high RRI. Pretty high, probably. That'd be a pretty good bump. So we're just kind of showing as we progress through there, you go in there and you do the sub-sealing. On the bottom left, uh, you'll see that that's kind of a, a pavement that kind of rolled down through there. Uh, the bottom right, they've gone in there and they've actually uh, mud jacked, slab jacked essentially that slab and it's very smooth now. So quite a bit of difference. We don't see a lot of that. We saw more of that probably in uh, that application probably being done in the uh, mid 80s, I would say, to, to late, early uh, 90s. Joint and crack resealing. Uh, this is going to be a, a little bit of a demo, I believe, tomorrow morning. So it would be uh, advantageous for everybody to kind of look at that. Uh, essentially, there are several different types out there. When we get into joint and crack resealing, you know, there's kind of the aspect, well, are we trying to essentially keep all the water out, all the compressibles out? Uh, what are we trying to do? Are we just trying to fill it? Uh, there's some states out there right now that say, well, why do you need to have a, a joint uh, sealer out there? So there, there is some, a little bit of uh, confusion out there, but typically I think what most people or most states have certainly recognized, if you have essentially high volume traffic like on an interstate, it's possible that depending on what type of base, sub-base material you may have out there, that maybe you don't have to uh, essentially put one in. 
Uh, we found essentially that if you're into the lower volume traffic patterns, especially in the municipal market, uh, some of the county markets, we really need to go out there and make sure that we uh, properly seal the joints, essentially to keep the uh, incompressibles out there and to mitigate some of the water infiltration. Uh, there's essentially three types of sealants out there, the hot pores, silicones, uh, compressive seals, more of the upper Midwest states have probably done more of the compression seals than uh, probably some of the other states. But uh, a lot of the hot pores are being done as far as uh, crack resealing. Uh, the, the key thing there, again, is what we've heard in most of the other presentations is cleanliness. Uh, we just can't overemphasize that enough. Absolutely critical. Uh, real quickly, typically what we would do, uh, most of these are resealing applications. Uh, the material that's there is essentially uh, oxidized or maybe been pulled out, so you have to go in there and on the upper left we're showing that, yeah, you have to go out there and essentially plow it out or remove it. Uh, typically you also have to go in there with a saw that you want to make sure that you have a very clean face. And then you have to go, uh, uh, as we're seeing on the lower left, essentially you go in there and blow out the, the dust material that's left as a residue. And then on the lower right is essentially the application. Cross-stitching, uh, we don't see a lot of cross-stitching, but it does have its application. There are some pavements out there that uh, didn't use a longitudinal tie bar, uh, sometimes with the shoulder, uh, sometimes it was a centerline joint. Uh, typically now we see uh, all designs where they actually have the longitudinal tie bars now. But in the past, uh, we did have some issues. Uh, sometimes we also found a longitudinal crack. Uh, might have been some sub-base problems or something like that. So there's longitudinal crack. Uh, it, it, rather than do a full, uh, or full depth uh, replacement panel, uh, it became much more cost effective to essentially just cross stitch it. Uh, not, a, not a lot of magic to that. Uh, we'll just kind of show a couple of slides here. Uh, the important thing is to make sure you have the right angle. So you want to make sure you have the right angle, not only from the aspect of uh, the rebar going down, but you also want to make sure that you have the right spacing so that you're not too close to the edge. Because you do have to have that tie bar, which would be a rebar essentially going through the middle of the slab. So the first two kind of show that uh, you got some uh, guidelines out there. The last one, we're essentially uh, putting in the epoxy with, uh, uh, with the dip, uh, rebar in there, and then, of course, the finished product is on the lower right side. The last one I kind of want to mention is concrete overlays. Uh, the reason that we've kind of got this up there now is that sometimes we find that there are some applications uh, where maybe we can't essentially go in there and, and do uh, a chip seal or a thin, thin overlay or something like that. Uh, when you get into something like that, it might be best to essentially consider maybe a concrete overlay. And what I'm uh, showing here is there is a report. Everybody likes to see numbers, likes to see data. This is a report that was just published on some concrete overlays in the state of Iowa. And the reason it was done there is because the counties essentially have done most of the concrete overlays in the state of Iowa. Uh, Minnesota, the state there, uh, there's been more overlays on the county system there also than there has been on the state system. I think on this, the state system in Iowa, there's probably only been maybe, uh, I'm, I'm, this is just a wild guess, but maybe 120, 20 center line miles of concrete overlays. But if you look on the county system, essentially there's 1,200 miles of concrete overlay on uh, HMA and there's over 700 miles concrete on concrete. So when we're starting to look at data, you know, that's where we try to go. We try to find a place where we can get a lot of data, maybe start doing some analysis. Uh, the oldest one on the asphalt was 1977. It's still out there. So we've got, uh, I guess, 50 or 40 years, 40 years, not too bad for an overlay. On the concrete, it was 1980. So on the uh, average, I tried to put up there essentially what it is today. Uh, we've seen a real move towards the overlays in the last five years. So if you look at that, uh, the average overlay right now on asphalt is 12 years. Concrete's about 13 and a half. However, if you take out all the recent ones, if you go back to 2005, look at the data there, the average overlay on the asphalt's uh, 20, 25, 26 years, and the concrete is uh, 20 plus. So it's kind of interesting when you look at those, 
They range in thickness, two inches, pretty thin, very thin, up to 12 inches. Uh, we see a lot more heavier type concrete overlays, say in Missouri, Colorado, uh, uh, where they're kind of getting up to uh, essentially the 10, 11 inches there. Panel size, three feet to 40 feet on these concrete overlays. So if you get that report, uh, that, that one there is just kind of a tech brief. Uh, it's very quick, very easy to read. Uh, and it'll give you quite a bit of analysis that's been done in that regard. So here's just a couple of pictures. Uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of them have been done on the county system. Uh, that's uh, 2006, the top picture, kind of a nice picture. This time of the year, we got a little greenery out there. The bottom left, uh, that's a project that was done uh, in a municipality, Lamar's, Iowa. It's not a very large town, uh, maybe uh, 4,000, 5,000. But that's a concrete, uh, uh, essentially it's concrete inlay there. Uh, Washington County, 1977. So you, again, that's 40 years, and that, that slab looks pretty good. Uh, we've also got several general, general aviation airports in Iowa that have had concrete overlays. Uh, that particular uh, slide there, 1971, uh, that was taken in 1971, but that overlay was done about uh, 15 years prior to that. Uh, Grundy County, bottom left, 1978. Uh, I did put the Oklahoma I-35, Interstate 35. If you're familiar in Oklahoma, coming out of Texas, that's I-35. Very high volume traffic, a lot of trucks, a lot of trucks. Uh, so that was a concrete overlay that was built in 2004, and that picture was taken last year. So very good performer there with very high. Uh, Iowa 13, that was essentially a research project that was done. That's where they looked at several different widths. You'll note there that we've got uh, essentially, I think those uh, six by six. So they, the shoulder is a little bit wider, but they striped it at 12 foot. And uh, there are several different sections, uh, thicknesses that go through there. And that was constructed in 2002. So that's essentially 15 years old. So here's uh, a couple of other bulletins you might be interested in. Uh, these are publications that we put out. Uh, the one on the left, that's a map brief. We put, try to put out a map brief every quarter. Uh, it's essentially a synthesized version of some uh, what we hope to be something that's innovative or something that we've proved uh, in the very recent days that could be a benefit for everybody. The one on the right, that's a publication uh, that the Iowa Highway Research Board wanted to do essentially for the cities and counties in the state of Iowa. That essentially goes through as to what maybe you should be looking at in regard to future durable type mixes. Uh, we've learned a lot in the past few years that, that uh, have certainly made improvements. Within that document, there's also uh, a little bit of pavement repair in there, some assessment, and there's also links. We decided to put hot links in this particular uh, uh, brochure or bulletin to essentially go to the standards within the Iowa DOT. So, uh, and they got some pretty good uh, design details out there in regard to uh, pavement repair. Uh, summary, I'm not gonna go through all of it. You've already seen it. And if there's any questions, I'll be around today, around tomorrow. Uh, I want to make sure that we're on time for break. So, uh, and I just love this slide. You got to love this. You know, this is an 18-foot slide, you know, 18-foot pavement. We wouldn't build it today, but uh, we actually have 18-foot bare pavements in Iowa. They've been essentially turned over to the county because, you know, from a safety standpoint, we couldn't keep them on the primary system. But it's pretty amazing. And these were all built in the uh, uh, teens and 20s. Uh, we didn't get into 20-foot pavements until we were uh, in the 30s in Iowa. So, you know, we got a lot of old pavements out there, but they're narrow, so can't be on a primary system. So, turn that back over. Thank you for your time. Uh, the preceding was produced by the National Center for Pavement Preservation. More information can be found on the web at pavementpreservation.org. Additional support provided by Michigan State University.